My name is John Vaughn. Uh, I'd like to thank Shy Art and at least you guys for coming. I appreciate the uh, invitation, the opportunity to um, think a little bit about uh, what I've done and what I'm doing and what I'm interested in. Um, so here we go. Um, it, it's, it's an interesting moment. We had more of us faculty, I guess, give this opportunity to uh, give this talk uh, at some point. Uh, and we were just talking, it's often, and maybe it was more productive for us than maybe for those of you who are listening uh, to actually uh, work through um, where we are and where we're going. Um, hopefully, there's something that is All right. Um, structure of the lecture. Uh, for a lot of you, um, you guys maybe know, but for most folks here at SIR, um, it's probably sort of like, who is that guy? How did he get this job? Um, so I'm going to address a little of that maybe first, um, and then we'll get into the work that he is shortly. So um, when people ask where I'm from, I'm from there. Um, this was family time, this was school time, this was practice, professional time, this was building, beginning to think of my own um, ideas and how to implement them uh, and learning what uh, it meant to actually uh, inhabit both the discourse and the uh, practice of construction and making architecture. And then this is where I am right now, um, teaching a lot, building not as much as I did back then there. Um, uh, I think what it shows um, maybe is that uh, each one of these, these are all places that I've at least had at least lived um, for a few months or a number of years. So I spent a big chunk of San Francisco, a big chunk of chunk of undergrad. University of Virginia, Ohio State. This is I in Tokyo. So anyway, size and location. So anybody asks where I'm from? Um, what they really mean, especially here, uh, when they ask where are you from, is they mean where are you from in architecture. Um, they don't really care. It's not particularly interesting. Maybe what someone has done um, in the past outside of the practice. Um, so, in the context of this lecture, I'll concentrate on those relevant moments. Um, as an undergraduate, I went to the University of Virginia, um, where we learned, um, let's say, the formal language of architecture. Um, things like the mathematics of the ideal villa, shown here at the bottom, column row. Comparing things um, over time, 16th century, 20th century, or sorry, 20th century, 16th century, um, Villagash and uh, Villamon Malcontenta, finding um, rules, systems that might apply sort of out of time, um, out of uh, cultural context, issues like parquet, symmetry, geometry. Additive, subtractive, the ground, circulation, these really kind of things we did when um, I was uh, almost at your age in school. And that's a long design by college. Um, for grad school, um, I went to Ohio State, uh, where very different things were going on. Um, this is Peter Eisman's uh, Henry School. Uh, studies that he did starting with basically bar types, and form Z, we were uh, what we call scripting now, macro uh, uh, operations on types, um, folding, disruptions, things like that. Um, he had finished the Wexner Center at Ohio State a few years earlier, and we were looking at things like Ben um, Leapskin's chamber works. Uh, so a very different um, exposure, a lot more having to do with Contemporary critical discourse, uh, digital technologies, uh, and um, from 
from there, um, I moved on to uh, Tokyo, where I worked for Arata Hisazaki and Associates, where we um, were interested in both participating in the discourse uh, of architecture at large, as well as building, and finding a way to um, articulate ideas um, about um, architecture and uh, what was being discussed at the time in Bill Quam's the Nara Convention Center. I spent some time working on that. This is the Boone Astronomical Observatory. Uh, Astronomical Observatory, this is the Center of Science and Industry in Columbus, Ohio. Um, it's here that I started to be exposed to ways of putting these things together. At the time, um, when I was an undergraduate, graduate student, there wasn't a lot of uh, connection, let's say, between discourse and technology, research and experimentations, and actually what happens when the rubber hits the road. Where here, um, I was able to at least see how this particular architect um, dealt with things like geometries, fabrication systems, material palettes, um, prefabrication, uh, things like that, um, <coughs> while at the same time participating in the any conference, things like that. Um, at that moment, I moved back to um, the United States, to Seattle, where I worked construction um, for a few years for a custom home builder. I was sort of an attempt to get out of the office and uh, away from the, the computer and the pencil and the study model. Um, this was the beginning when I, where I was able to um, begin to think about my own ideas rather than, say, consuming and trying to understand only the work and the ideas of others. Um, it was here where I could begin to start putting things together. Um, so I opened up my own design build firm, um, did some projects that we'll see later. And one event that I co curated with a friend of mine, um, who now is a big, um, in Seattle, we decided to put together an art. We were invited to put together an architectural exhibition. Um, I had a small kind of squatter's gallery outside my office in Seattle where we showed things that typically couldn't get shown. So, you know, cancer research maps or illustrators or graphic design work, stuff that in a gallery that required um, remuneration needed to make some money in order to stay open. Um, this was sort of leftover space in our building. So we just got this thing started. We sold anything, we bought lights or bought paint. Um, so the uh, director at Blur uh, knew about me from that and um, put, up, put me together with Kai. And the two of us decided, rather than do a conventional architecture show in the sense that we're going to show buildings, pictures, and models, this is up in the Northwest, um, which uh, is at least um, from the outside apparently bereft of um, uh, many of the kind of interesting ideas that were swirling around. Our attempt here was to show that in fact wasn't the case. It was just that architects were not able to practice and build um, uh, conventional projects. They had to actually inhabit a space um, outside of the, what is known as the professional practice of architecture in order to explore the kind of interesting ideas that were going on. So um, we had, uh, this was actually a former CIRC student doing digital game environments. Microsoft building city. Um, this was a guy who was trained in Cranbrook, um, who did film installation, a kind of immersive film narrative environment. Um, this was a group working at a corporate firm who uh, uh, scavenged material off the historical building and built structures from that. Uh, Alex uh, subsequently won the Rome Prize for a few years ago. Uh, stacking two by fours, um, kind of a, another way of using a normative building system uh, technology. Uh, Mark uh, cleaned up a, a sort of toxic area in the parking lot outside the site, sort of a Matt and Clark intervention, took ownership over a found derelict space um, and planted and remediated uh, kind of prefab folks that filmed and documented a kind of construction and destruction of the gallery space, notational system for movement, Professor University of Washington. Lead pencil folks, uh, field, um, applied space. These guys won the prize later as well. Um, uh, sound installation, 
walk through a kind of immersive stick environment, images, uh, recognizing types, archetypes, and trying to undermine um, what it means to understand a, a building in terms of how you see it. Um, Lola Palos Andrini uh, is doing a lot of fantastic work um, up in Seattle and all over the world now, um, sort of uh, three dimensional scanning and music and, and projection laser installation work, and then an immersive environment sort of suit that you would wear to be swallowed in a digital architectural environment. So this for me was um, the only way at the time I could um, participate in both the discourse and the production of um, what I would still call architecture. Um, that moment, um, I started um, alternating between teaching and coming to Los Angeles. If you remember from the map before, sort of back and forth between Los Angeles and the East Coast. Um, I spent some time consulting at David Ginnick uh, for Kevin and Chris, where I worked on some projects um, with them, uh, for them. Um, a couple of things that I worked on, this was uh, the Santa Monica Parks project. Uh, this was an addition to the Lawrence residence, which was a restoration of the well-known uh, Morpheus project, uh, and then I spent a bunch of time working on that new Robert Ellis project, which is really cool. What was interesting about these, uh, this opportunity I had, that I had, other than they seem to have been in a kind of gray, gray moment of work, <laughs> it was that assembly and it was silver. But um, uh, here, what was interesting is they had identified a um, concrete prefabrication system, and by learning the kind of tolerances that we distorted and warped these panels and then assembled them into um, uh, these pavilions in Santa Monica Park. And what I found was really interesting about that, I was hired to help to figure out how to make them and install them. Um, the idea that you could begin to design architecture from inside a system that you could identify beforehand. So before you knew what this was going to be, you learned about that, figured out the parameters of that system. Um, this was interested in um, complex prefabrication and ways of doing that. Um, here was a kind of material science, um, high detail uh, project where we were reinterpreting in many ways due to material constraints um, what Tom had done in the past. And then this was a lot of programming, let's say the sort of software, um, choreographing events and locations. And so those were the things that I worked on that I found. Um, nicely um, led into things that I um, were interested in. This beginning of maybe a way to figure out how to inhabit both the idea world outside, the kind of discourse ideas that I was interested in myself as an individual, um, as a young architect, um, and then how maybe there are these tools out there if I had access to build. So, um, at this point, I'm starting to do a lot of teaching, so I'm having some time thinking about um, what I could be um, exploring. This is a course I taught at Rhode Island School of Design. Um, I was interested in um, issues of uh, manipulation of time and the kind of transformation, using that as the medium to work. Um, it's something that has um, interested me for a while, and I had an opportunity while I was there with the facilities at Brown being in New England, um, where I could um, access a set of technologies at the time to, to explore these things, and students that were interested in, in um, helping, helping out and exploring that. So I'd like to read a, a brief uh, quote from Sanford Quinter and his Architectures of Time publication, which I think summarizes far better than I ever will. Um, this idea that um, architecture position, can position itself if we think of it not as a static material thing only, but as a kind of colleague in this larger event continuum of things that are happening um, faster, slower, let's say Bergson's notion of duration, where um, in fact there, the building doesn't exist outside of the concept of time. Um, it in fact inhabits it just at different scales. So, for example, here, um, thus the object, be it a building, a compound site, or an entire urban matrix, insofar as such unities continue to exist at all as functional terms, 
would be defined now not by how it appears, but rather by practices, those it partakes of and those that take place within it. And then at the end, it would therefore be a mistake, I would argue, to limit the concept of architectural substance to building materials and geometric volumes they engender and close. Just as the meaning of a sentence differs depending on who's speaking, to whom it is addressed, the time and place in which it is uttered, the infinitely complex interplay of will, desire, and systems of legitimate legitimization, as well as on those, these same conditions of the reference of each and every element of the sentence. So any proper understanding of architecture must also confront its character as, a, as an event, or at the very least, an element inseparable from and in constant interface with the world of force, will, action, and history. So here, um, what we were interested in is working essentially in taking advantage of the opportunities of things in motion, things changing over time. So I'll just briefly explain these, these projects. Um, this was a student that um, projected in a plexiglass box a film she had taken earlier. And then in this space in the bottom, there was water on the white surface and a white hole. So the projected image was in the ceiling coming down. And she had set up a drop, a kind of medical you know, chemistry drop, that would drop black ink into this water set to a, a particular rhythm. So we had the, let's say, the interval of the film and the time that was contained within that projection, as well as us occupying the space seeing this piece, as well as the interval of the ink that would gradually um, block out and then reflect the image. So the image first would pass through or reflect down onto the floor or onto the ceiling, and then as the black ink would uh, interact with the water, gradually the image would appear um, in the black ink. Here, um, the student was interested in the box man, some of the students read it today, where we took a, a film and um, projected it in a time delay. So what was happening in terms of what was projected, what, was hap what had happened a few moments in the past. So that plus the materiality. So we could actually occupy, in this case, a space that was constantly changing. And we were, the student was manipulating what we were seeing, when we were seeing it, and how we were seeing it. Here, using some casting technologies, projection of material and fabric. Um, this one was based on uh, Sergei Eisenstein's glass house, where um, she was able to access the green screen room and, and spent time moving and documenting her own movements and then creating architecture short film which is based on that. This student um, was projecting through um, a, a wax disc that was being heated um, and this was on a, a loop and so we were being we were projecting the wax disc as it was before and then it was being um, projected through the wax disc as it was now. So as this decayed due to temperature the image changed but we had a memory of so these are all just experiments trying to figure out how we um, can actually use, in that case, material behavior um, and the documentation of um, information uh, through time. The problem with that, of course, is right, what do we make from it? You know, what, what do you do with that? And so some experiments we did, um, casting lends itself very well to um, uh, engaging issues of, of time that kind of choreography is required. The student here um, created a kind of scaffold that sat in a hot pot of water and then by dripping warm wax and adjusting the temperature of the water and the water level by adding, uh, adding heat or moving water or adding cold water, um, began to be able to control when and how this wax formed would adhere to the scaffold, so with a little more development things to get increasingly organized here. Um, <clears throat> kind of motion casting, a series of balloons inside balloons inside balloons, and by those of you who would want me now know very well, um, the sort of dynamic process it is to cast um, like that. And then here, um, variation, you know, using a, a single mold and then um, having, in this case, very mechanical um, levers to use the same kind of slip cast a variable uh, variation form. 
Um, they are teaching in uh, Syracuse. Uh, this was exploring and trying to um, use mapping strategies, um, uh, a sort of historical, let's say, um, interaction with um, how things change over time and duration. So in this case, <clears throat> this was uh, kind of Gidebor psychogeography, um, where uh, the student was mapping, uh, had a, a map of Rome, actually, and then was documenting an emotional topography in terms of various characters and various routes, and then that translated into a kind of um, formal language. This simulations are underway, this is real flow, you know, um, setting up conditions where you can document, um, let's say, particle behaviors. Um, this was a translation of public transportation systems um, in times of the city of Tokyo. So when, they, when stations are busier, um, less busy where they are in the city relative to each other. This is Brasilia. Um, this had to do with uh, circulation, pedestrian transportation. Uh, right, public transportation and private transportation. Um, this was an attempt to kind of musically notate the city of Venice creating a vocabulary of architecture that would translate um, much like musical notes would and coming up with a way to um, script all that out and uh, possibilities were here. This was a um, internet uh, sort of a test where you, uh, the student would send out packets of information and trace where they would travel and where they would come back, <coughs> the duration, how long that would happen, how long that would take. Um, and then here was a kind of historical study. This is the city of LA. Um, historical events um, in areas of downtown and their um, physical, uh, let's say, impact um, as mapped and traced to uh, architecture and public spaces. And then um, translated that into a kind of a spatial diagram. And then the problem again um, is now what are you doing? So we've come up with some interesting ways of studying something like that. So um, in this case, kind of ferry building that's you know trying to uh, mediate um, you know, the flows of water, traffic, boats in the city of Venice here, a kind of topography that might shape. This is uh, New Orleans start to shape the flow of water and people in circulation. This is a kind of um, synthesis of change over time and how that might become a single um, entity and then finally a kind of just expressive things are moving so that is uh, apparently dynamic. Um, I think this is a nice opportunity to talk about um, how this plays out in something like Japan. Um, with the Japan um, studio in the fall, uh, there's a seminar where we're interested in issues of narrative. And narrative is as a history of dealing with issues with time and its manipulation, um, whether it's um, things like flashbacks or um, film, uh, or whether it's historical references or embedded kind of subtext in literature. Um, the, the narrative and all its various manifestations and various media uh, has a long history of the kind of thing that um, I'm talking about. So these are some students on a short travel trip. This is kind of a manga-based Here's where we are, here's where we were, um, book publication. This was a film that the student made um, and edited a series of places that we visited. This was, the student um, took a series of short films and then built a kind of bento box um, and, and little uh, LCD screens projected at different times and intermittently um, various events that happened. So there was this kind of encapsulated um, lunch box. Activity. Um, this was a kind of installation piece, a collection of objects found. Um, some of these things were rotting, some of them were flaking away. These were sort of material properties, um, wrappers that were found in the cave. And so, uh, while obviously not, let's say, directly um, architectural in the sense of making structure, making buildings, um, I think a really interesting way to carry out issues of uh, how we can inhabit, in this case, a kind of performance of time. This piece right here, I, I really enjoyed. This was, I don't know if you know Ray Johnson's work, but um, this student um, decided to invent um, a series of relationships in the mail um, 
on her trip. So she looked up addresses um, in different places in the, in the country and started mailing them notes, various media emails, uh, mostly mail, telephone calls, to create a kind of temporary um, relationship. So she'd send notes like, hey, Japan's great, wish you were here, I'm sorry you couldn't make it, but it would be to a complete stranger. And so the responses she would get, and then tracking and mapping you know, where it was sent, where it came back, who responded, who didn't, um, and ways of um, communication, which communication elicited you know, more response, less response, and kind of response. So um, these kind of things, I think, are um, maybe they're a little far from um, uh, direct uh, from the production of let's say architecture in the material sense uh, in terms of exploring the idea and using other um, disciplines that are, have a lot more experience in these kind of issues um, than we do as architects. It's a good idea. So, so what? Um, so, so far, that's sort of before I was making stuff. Um, maybe not exactly chronologically. So, I started making things. Some of these things happened while these other things were happening um, that I described before. But this is me doing my best. Um, here, um, I think basically things that I'm interested in uh, come down to two things. But, um, there are issues of building, how do we make this stuff in this world that we have it, touch, um, and then these issues of change over time, kind of duration issues, and how we can manipulate um, space and architecture and, and all these things that happen, whether it's sunlight, whether it's the decay of the material, whether it's the time that it takes for me to walk to front door, all these scales of time, and that architecture is a possible um, meteor and all that. Um, this is a, some early projects. This, these um, two projects, I would say, don't yet engage any of those things. Or they, if they do, they do it incidentally. They were done a long time ago, kind of mid, mid to late 90s, um, where essentially it was an existing home. Um, we needed that to study, but we needed light. So how do you have a solid but generate light? Box, how to collect the material, and then basically carve out all the way around underneath and behind and circulate up and around. Um, and, uh, and then here, we essentially took what was a single cube at that point, all I can handle, um, but this gets replicated, so bigger cubes, smaller cubes, three different materials. So, board form concrete, wooden drywall, um, metal, and then uh, cement board. So um, this, I think, represents a kind of way of working, I'd say, more closely affiliated with my time at the University of Virginia, sort of um, party fixed, out of time, kind of translates you know, a box in a building, kind of geometry, circulation, uh, a, a static way of looking at Obviously, the light moves around, and obviously, you circulate through all these buildings. Staircases. So, but those are, let's say, less embedded in the design process at that point for me um, than complete. Um, so, uh, next bunch of work. Now, um, this stage, I'm starting to do some of my own uh, research explorations, kind of on an informal project. This is, you know, mid mid nineties, late, you know, kind of ninety seven or so. Flash. Um, and I thought, all right, here's a really interesting, really easy way to start to play with the time in a media that we're used to, architects, the line drawing. We make plans, we make sections. So rather than me drawing the plan, or me drawing the section, what about we set up two conditions, condition A and condition G, and manipulate what happens in between, how fast it happens, what element moves at what speed, deceleration, acceleration, what piece becomes another piece. So this is a very, this is kind of a, low, low tech, very simple way. But the idea is we're interesting. You spend your time manipulating keyframes and time, um, not worried about whether that should be a different profile or the light or space as a certain kind of effect. So what that leads to is some projects, in this case, um, they didn't get built, they were commissioned. Um, this was a project in, in Ohio um, where it was interesting because there's this tradition of man making building, of course, architecture. This is an old timber frame that they wanted to use, an old barn. Um, but also the man manipulating the earth. There's serpent mounds and the whole history of the Native Americans. Um, 
for the new that's manipulating the earth. And in many ways, the earth is as artificial in a place like Royal Isle as any building would be. Um, so you have this uh, condition where the land and the ground are kind of both artificial, and maybe an opportunity to see them juxtaposed together. Like, how would they interact? What if we brought that kind of geometry, that kind of space, um, uh, in through something like a frame? So we have curvy, um, let's say more indeterminate um, kinds of uh, adjacencies and spaces and shapes framed quite literally by a rectilinear system, the topography of the Earth and a rectilinear frame here. An existing house in the northern part of Seattle, typical ranch burger, normative in every way, uh, built in the 50s, looks like every house built, vinyl siding and all that. So here was an, an attempt to, okay, again, what would that become? If this was going to become something else, if this was on its way, if this was rectilinear on its way to topography or topography on its way to kind of the Euclidean system, then maybe this is a condition that's on its way to become something else. So turning towards the light, taking the roof element, the facade language and element, basically just twisting and flipping it around on itself. So things are getting a little bit um, more fluid, things are getting a little bit more uh, uh, integrated in the sense that these ideas of how can we inhabit and work in something that's fluid and changing and dynamic, actually part of the design process as opposed to sort of apply and you know, after the fact. Here's some later work. Um, this, this was a, a project in a different part of Ohio. This was the part that was built. This part was unbuilt. This was uh, an office um, space in Seattle, and this was a, an interior of an old brick warehouse in uh, San Francisco. So that is this plan, and that's not built, but that is what was built. So here, um, now I'm starting to get the opportunity to maybe build some of these things, test things in the slide before that, that weren't possible um, to build before. Uh, and so, you know, what can I do with space? What can I do with material? And the transition between you know, things that you can that reflect, things that light transmits through, things that are clear, spaces that begin to twist. What can drywall do with bend? Um, that sort of thing here, um, rather than single uniform projects before boxes, rigorous geometry, very determined, this is inside, this is out kind of situation, things start slipping and sliding. And then this project, which I, I still like, but I never ended up getting good photographs of, um, this was in an, an existing brick warehouse um, in the Marina District in San Francisco, and the client, in this case, um, wanted it as, as her house. Um, and so what we did is we located, the, let's say, the software, the functions and programming that weren't allowed to be moved due to things like plumbing or whatever, so cooking, bathroom, entrance. Um, and those were fixed. Uh, and then everything else, sitting, eating, sleeping, sometimes you sleep on the couch, sometimes you eat outside, sometimes whatever, um, those were left to float and float around. And I'm trying to create a kind of architecture where you never, ever see everything, that the, the, these spaces compress and contract, Light comes in from skylights and is blocked. Um, you, you feel these things pushing you and pulling you and stretching you. The difference between moving through a space that's, let's say, open and that tall, and then coming in and being compressed and then talking and you're coming back out. Um, in this case, a faceted language as opposed to a curvilinear language. Um, getting, I think, closer to trying to create a, a series of, uh, uh, through building, a, theory, a series of conditions, spatial conditions, and, and you know, material effects that might uh, engage us uh, in the kind of, kind of issues that I'm, that I'm interested in. All right, so um, wrapping up, two projects, two recent projects. Um, I think we're starting to get a little closer to pulling, pulling these things together. Um, uh, in architect years, I'm still a young man, but uh, most other. So, um, so here was a project, this was an installation at RISD that I did with um, OSA, Open Source Architecture, and uh, Dr. Edward Mostig at uh, Loyola Marymount. <coughs> and a couple of things. Um, what was interesting, what started off was this was the menu in the um, architecture school lobby, an installation, the architecture school of Rhode Island School. And while I was there, I became enamored with lofty drawings, the kind of whole design line drawings. This method of communicating curvilinear complex surfaces in two dimensions, 
doing things like a language where you superimpose um, bow and stern or aft, you um, actually have a complete, along with the table of, of offsets, the complete instructions to translate something incredibly complex um, in its very own graphic language. And in a sense, this doesn't, it doesn't become what it is until it does what it's supposed to do. Um, it doesn't make sense. That won't stand up by itself. It has to be in water. And so this idea that, uh, you know, wait a minute, maybe here's a drawing that, the way that you know, was established hundreds of years ago, a graphic strategy that's not, say, a series or a sequence or a superimposition that um, implies a kind of movement and change and sort of fluid performance criteria that typically an architecture is you know, the plan is actually happy. So they were interested in now Gabo. Um, we had no money, no time. Uh, so we thought, okay, something light. We looked at our precedents, Sandbeck, Lippold, Gabo, you know, uh, composite sale, construction. All these are light ways of describing space using a line. And what happens if we, if we built the drum rather than built the hall? Um, this is um, Zanakis, Kandala and Zanakis again. Um, uh, other precedents in terms of using you know, complex geometries, um, in this case, a sort of time episodic um, strategy for organizing information and then, like you said, in this case, architecture. So we couldn't get to make a building, uh, but we could maybe build a drawing and have that drawing. So here um, we have the. Um, this is when um, Ed got involved. Um, we needed to create uh, essentially um, an object out of lines in an, uh, what he would call a mathematically significant form, which is a great term, um, where we could build something like that in here. Um, and it needed to be controlled somehow. It was a question of just like making the shape. Um, so uh, Ed. Um, as a mathematician, um, was aware of the Riemann zeta function, which is something that can handle and is um, suited to create uh, the kind of half rounds. Um, in ship modeling, they build these half rounds that can mount on the wall, essentially the half of the hull, where we could model the half rounds and suspend them in space. You can see an early um, iteration in Mathematica, which was the technology we used to generate um, these forms and the equations. Constantly, this is the existing building, which nothing quite lines up with anything. But we wanted to create a kind of say, mathematically significant form in it that we could inhabit. So um, uh, we were able to establish a kind of ordering system that mediated between the existing condition and this um, space we wanted to create. Um, here it is. The equation you can't do, it, but anyway, the equations that establish this. And this um, and we built it. So um, here, for example, I, I like this picture because it's it's um, it's the drawing. You know, it's, it's a frame. It's hard maybe to see, but here it's easier to see. Where you can actually see the um, the whole profile. And of course, we started to break it down in the superposition of four and half and, and all of those sorts of things. So it begins to break down. Let's say it simply rather than being simply a kind of profile of a hull and leaving it at that, um, the idiosyncrasies of the space, the equation, um, we were able to um, sort of build this thing, and there it is and have it. So we, you, know, you could actually climb in one of those drawings. Um, so here maybe you could see uh, the whole profile, and depending on your point of view, what you're looking at, um, you can begin to see you know, the different sections. And then here, level of detail, the kind of precision that was possible, we color-coded the lines, varying densities due to um, curves, the degree to which um, curves were being, uh, the vector of the curve was being changed. Everything was in tension, um, no mechanical fasteners or anything here, everything had to be measured and built, built here, actually at SIR and assembled. And then, um, you know, even something like this that exists in the world of mathematics in many ways, out of the material. Drawing, for God's sakes. Um, for me, anyway, it's also when those things hit the ground and the rubber hits the ground. I don't think we have to choose between one or the other. I think there's a way to do, be interested in both. 
um, and provide uh, produce architecture that um, deals with that. Okay, last project. Um, um, this is a house that was just completed um, up north in Carmel, um, and uh, what's interesting about a place like Carmel is, it's a, in many ways, it's an artificial construction. It was, it was set up and developed um, as a um, area for, let's say, expat, expats from Los Angeles and San Francisco and other parts of California, and they had this vision of this cottage, crafty um, location, a lot of trees, it's on the coast, water, um, sort of mixing between um, people who want to live out in the woods and have other interests, artists, um, spiritualists, that sort of thing. Um, it has an incredibly rigorous planning process. They're very concerned and interested with what gets produced. Um, it's a kind of um, theater and so things like that, things like that, things like that, things like that, um, are what is Carmel's at the level, let's say, of image, um, and what it's interested in becoming and becoming more of. So that's very hard to see in this, but that's me. That's me in the sort of next stage of these things. What's happening here in terms of research is I'm, I'm actually in a cave environment, which I was able to um, Use in Brown University, which is so far. I started with the flash, right? Um, and then maybe I guess I missed it, but um, I started with a flash two dimensional, or then in a later slide, there were um, three dimensional in Cinema 4D where we were scripting and, um, uh, various, uh, let's say, formal collisions and transformations over time. Um, then um, we started working with Maya and Image, a kind of combination of both. Um, let's say film content and using that as a driver for the transformation of objects in mind, the physical um, modeling engines and whatnot that they have there. So increasingly from say basic two-dimensional um, line manipulation, getting closer and closer to three dimensions, physical properties, materiality, like real effects that we can measure and, and, and you know, manipulate. So here is um, sort of where it was left off, um, which is, you know, the body in a space and that movement of that body being tracked now, you know, what we really need to do now is hack a weed or something and, you know, do it here. It's like that, the, the next step now is to use the kind of video game technology and do this. At the time, this was a kind of immersive environment where my emotions and movements could be um, uh, translated quite directly into um, three-dimensional digital information and at that, that, my speed, um, where I am physically, So if you're working there and you're interested in that, the question is how do you put those things together? Um, so what I was trying to do um, was find a way to speak their language, the language that Kamal and City was concerned about, this kind of um, uh, contextual um, symbols and sign environment. Um, but bring it into a, a, um, an architectural experience, language, changing time, space, the compression, complex geometries that create the sort of fluid conditions that are less fixed um, than what they have prescribed. So um, what we did here was we set up a kind of language um, where, let's say, everyone, contemporary American residential construction, everybody knows how to build that. Just that ball right there. City of Carmel Planning Office wants that. So we know how to make this. We know how to make it look like that. So using those components, rather than saying, okay, I refuse to acknowledge whatever you say um, you want, I'm an architect, I have a vision, um, we're going to fight about that. I decided what would be most interesting was let's see if we can use um, these basics, build it, what it takes to build and make something, and the kind of language of, let's say, a fixed history, you know, a craft cottage that will never change. Um, what if we use that? Uh, let's exploit it. I don't want to say, not, not in a cynical way, but in a way like, okay, those, that's the game. 
Um, that's a play. So if you use this as a kind of alphabet, they can be assembled A, 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 A prime A, A, B, A. Um, if you know how residential, American residential construction is typically done, they, they lay down, um, they build a wall flat on the floor deck and then tilt it up. So the guy who's building that doesn't really care what, who's, what they're building across the way. In addition, the permitting process required elevations to be posted publicly. Elevations, not a model, not a three-dimensional rendering. So if the elevations looked like that, and if we could build it like that, there's nothing interesting, nothing to see here. So <clears throat> the three elevations that are most apparent on the street are that, which is that, that, which is that, and that, which is that. And only if you look carefully, the roof doesn't quite line up, a weird saddle thing happening, and that chimney's kind of doing something probably we shouldn't do. So, um, what that enables is that when you mismatch these two facades and you use linear elements to connect them, rafters, you get a hyperbolic surface which gives you the kind of complexity, let's say at least difference between canopy and the uh, ground, um, that might be something What becomes important is how we get to here. This is the throat of the project. This is where all that complexity, all that control, all that kind of relationship, that real-time feedback with the body and, and my rhythm of me walking that time comes to the ground. That's when the curvy stuff that's up in the air that then maybe inhabits the forest or the landscape, what kind of scale of the environment and sun and the seasons comes down to the individual walking through the hallway and feeling you know, sort of buffeted about and how things change as you move through through that phase. So there's this module of the block, it's jammed into here. We mismatch these to allow light to come in from opposite sides. So this room here is on the north. We need light from the south, so we don't have that module line up with that module. We have them deliberately missed so that light can sneak in over the roof. So this Roof becomes a kind of performative skin that both creates a kind of complex surface, very different from rectilinear, um, almost like a drawing. I mean, it, it was drawn smooth and black like that. Wanted to look like a cartoon of what Kamau wanted, um, but we could end up with conditions like that. Ultimately, getting into the thing, me in the cave, you know, the thing that I was interested in, which is there in the center. So quickly moving through, you arrive, nothing to see here. A goofy little Carmel Cottage, maybe there's some weirdness going there, but if we walk quickly, we won't be subjected to it. Um, here's where it comes together into a single object. You begin as you get closer to see that things have gone horribly awry. Um, and then as you move forward, um, finally when you get into the center area, Things have that chimney that was normal isn't anymore. The roof that maybe at that elevation looked right. That is just a rate, but because of the misaligned elevations, you end up with these sort of twists and torsions. And because building and the material issues that I'm interested in, I know how much plywood will bend. So we use the parameters of say that roofing deck plywood to limit how much that would be allowed so that they can build it in the same way they build any roof anywhere else. Um, uh, and in the front door, things get a little muddy, and then as you move in, you start, so here's where we were, here's where we are, here's where we're going. Um, as you enter, then you're in the throat. So you've gone through this entrance here, you're in the throat, you begin to see through and out. As you move in here, it sort of leaks out. That structure, that throat core that we just walked through actually extends out and informs the flying sort of Soaring canopies. Looking back, that's where we came in. There's the clear story that they're letting the light in. See your back and forth. Here, you're looking back from whence we came. And then when you finally get to the end, uh, this little whatever architectural card that they've shot, um, where you have um, those sort of, uh, let's say, the scale of the human and that kind of throat and twist give way to just horizontal topography and mostly floor space. 
So the flat was an existing foundation that we reused. Um, so the rectilinear language of American construction and what was there, and then this um, sort of complexity, hopefully um, pulling together into that throat where it actually comes down and you feel it. Um, so that's it. Um, basically what I'd like to sort of end on is um, I think um, through this process of pulling this thing together, um, it's been interesting to see um, how these things, say in retrospect, have led. I think the, the increasing complexity and in modes and methods of exploring issues of, on one hand, building and fabrication and making, um, and the technologies that are available to us now, and how they can interact with both conventional, traditional, and emerging and contemporary construction practice, and this issue of um, time and inhabiting a kind of world where everything is in some kind of duration of change, like it's all moving. We just have to play in that, let's say, the eddies of that, of that water. And so if we can, if I can continue to get closer and closer, where on one hand, um, I'm embedding in the practice, um, the processes and techniques and strategies of not things that are fixed, but things that change with things that are being uncovered and ways of making and building together. I think together, those things um, make that architecture. Thanks.